Ephesus is situated on the west coast of Turkey, an area the Greeks called Ionia, and the Romans the province of Asia. This important city was once home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis. The late classical temple dating from the second half of the 4th century BC was located on the plain and was built on an east-west axis. It provided the grid system for the refounding of the city by King Lysimachus in about 300 BC. City walls, about 9 kilometers long, were built on the ridges of the hills. Here we see the model of the city in the Hellenistic period. Ephesus grew under the Romans. They developed the city even further and gave it an artificial harbor. After the serious earthquake in 270 AD, the city was rebuilt in the 5th century, but on a smaller scale. Ephesus was originally situated on the Aegean coast, but the rivers increasingly deposited silt, and the Romans finally created an artificial port linked to the canal. We can approach the city along this canal and cross the harbor to reach the main entrance, the port gate. Behind here was the Arcadiani, named after Emperor Arcadimus. It led to the city center and the theater. Traders used to sell their goods in the arcades on the left and right. Oil lamps lit up the gangways at night. We continue along the road towards the theater. The Arcadiane looks like this today. We walk through the eastern gate, which marked the end of the Arcadiane, to the theater, one of the largest in the ancient world. It could accommodate between 22 and 25,000 spectators. It fell into decay from the 6th century onwards. Its stones were used to construct the Byzantine city. During the Roman period, this was not only a place for theater productions and gladiator games. Public meetings also took place here. For example, this was where the decision was taken to expel the Apostle Paul from the city because the silversmiths were no longer able to sell their tiny silver figures of Artemis to pilgrims because of his missionary work. This is what it looks like today. The stage building, or Sikonai. This is how the Apostle Paul saw it, too. The spectator's seats with a canopy at the top. From here, we can glance westwards over the Roman city. We can see the port and the Arcadiane in the background again. The Marble Street, flanked by Nero's Hall and the commercial market, runs from the theater to the Celsus Library. The governor Celsus had this built at the beginning of the second century as a library, the municipal archives, and his tomb. The library fell into ruins after the earthquake at the end of the third century. The magnificent facade looks like this today. It is the emblem of the current archaeological site. What looks like a small round temple was a Roman water clock. A magnificent stairway led to the heart of the Celsus Library. The library building formed the western end of Curete Street, which was lined with many tombs and memorials. Rich people had their houses on either side of it, near the city center. This octagonal building, for example, is the tomb of Arsene IV, Cleopatra's sister. This was Roman town planning. Several houses with more than one floor in an enclosed area were built on an insula, a rectangular area measuring about 4,000 square meters. Let us look at it in more detail. The rooms were located on two floors around an inner courtyard with an ambulatory and a well, which was known as a peristyle. The walls were decorated with marble panels and wall paintings, and the floor with mosaics. This famous floor mosaic, with an edaidae riding on a hippocampus, a mythical animal that was half fish half horse, was discovered here. Next to it is a triton, 
a Greek sea god. These were mythical sea creatures in a rich house in the city, which had the most important port in the eastern Mediterranean after Alexandria. During the 250 years that they were used for residential purposes, the peristyle houses were converted and redesigned several times. We can now look towards the Roman upper city from these magnificent villas on the southern slope of what is now known as Bulbulda or Nightingale Hill. This was home to the state market, the government district of Ephesus, a square with buildings around it. The elongated basilica Stoa, with its two buildings at the end, and behind it the semicircular Bulluturion and the Praetanion to its left. A temple, public buildings, and a well completed the collection of buildings. Ancient Ephesus was actually covered with wells. Here is a Monopterus, a Roman well, the central water source in the upper city. The water system was highly ingenuous. Fresh water from sources to the south and east of the city was fed on aqueducts, and then into main pipes and secondary pipes along the insulae, to houses, wells, gymnasiums, and pools, to cater for drinking water, hygiene, and firefighting. The Vettius Gymnasium, a spacious Roman facility named after its sponsor Vettius, and built between 146 and 149 AD, was an example of the Roman bathing and body cult. The Palaestria, the courtyard with arcades for sporting activities. The Vettius Gymnasium was still used as a bathing pool between 300 and 500 AD before it fell into greater decay from the early 6th century onwards. The theater was also just a ruin during the Byzantine period. The Celsus Library became the facade for a well. And the terrace houses were turned into a craftsman's district. The foundations of the Monopterus were well used for a different purpose. A church was built, the so-called Tomb of Luke, who according to holy legend was buried in Ephesus. On the ancient foundations they built a two-story central building with a crypt and an interior where people could walk around. We now fly over the Byzantine city to the hill to the north. This is where the Seven Sleepers Holy Site is situated in the midst of a necropolis, and it was one of the most important pilgrimage places in the Byzantine period, and a popular stopping place for the Crusaders, too. Legend says that seven young men hid themselves in a gap in the rocks during the persecution of Christians in the middle of the 3rd century, and woke up again 200 years later. A church was built over the graves at the beginning of the 5th century, and following this a huge number of memorials, tombs, and other sacred buildings. Two sections show that they did not only build on the slope, but also constructed sacred rooms and tombs in the rock. This is the view of the church above the graves of the seven sleepers today, and its 3D reconstruction. There are a number of grave niches in the walls. The walls themselves are plastered. This is the view of the presbytery. Legend says that Mary Magdalene died here. She is also mentioned positively in the Quran and is therefore venerated by Muslims. Her grave in the Seven Sleepers Holy Site is therefore a place of pilgrimage for them too. We leave the pilgrimage site and fly over a church which was built on the foundations of the Temple of Artemis and continue to the atrium of Basilica of St. John. This is the memorial building established by the Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora. The atrium rests on a high platform. We enter the church through the lobby area. The architecture and inner fittings of the Basilica of St. John were based on the Hagia Sophia Church in Constantinople. We can see the ambo or pulpit and behind it the salia, the aisle or the presbytery. The ciborium, the altar, stands at the crossing. Beneath it is the burial site of St. John.
A sacred legend says that the beloved disciple of Jesus arrived in Ephesus with Mary in the seventh decade of the first century, and that both died here. So this is a very holy site for Christians, which explains the extremely rich decorations in the church. Behind the ciborium are the priest's seats. The raised one in the middle was for the bishop. The Basilica of St. John replaced the ancient shrine of Artemis in Byzantium as a pilgrimage site, a business center, and a place where refuge was granted until the Seljuklar conquered the city of Ephesus in 1090 A.D.